Hello, and thank you very much for inviting me today to present uh, cases in a very interesting area, which is overlapping epidemics of HIV and COVID. Before I start, just to highlight that the overlap is in many different areas. The three most important that I see as a clinician is uncontrolled HIV replication that might have a direct uh, impact on how people get sick and how they um, advance in the disease, also low CD4 count. Uh, another area is comorbidities related to AIDS, opportunistic infections, uh, and especially um, uh, cancers. And the third one is comorbidities related to COVID. So those diseases that are not uh, traditionally linked to HIV infection like diabetes, or heart uh, diseases that are definitely increasing the risks. And with this perspective, I would like to present three clinical cases that would show uh, how these factors interplay, and in fact, that we still don't understand much. So uh, sharing cases and discussing in, in them is absolutely important. So my first patient is a uh, young patient, 26-year-old uh, man having sex with men. Uh, who was diagnosed in 2017 on effective card with undetectable viral load, uh, his CD4 count perfect, 55% of CD4 uh, um, among all um, lymphocyte T, normal BMI, fit uh, person, uh, his only comorbidity is asthma with fluticasone and salmeterol, uh, and it's well controlled. He's uh, taking acetalopram uh, for depression. Uh, he had some history of uh, erosive uh, gastritis, but it's not treated at the moment. Uh, no co-infection. His lifestyle seems uh, perfect. He's not smoking, never been smoking. He drinks alcohol occasionally, and they, he usually don't get drunk. Uh, he uh, is not... Uh, using recreational drugs, or at least that's what he was saying. So on day first, uh, he is consulted at our emergency department in Warsaw with loss of smell since five days, dry cough and myalgia since four days, and dyspnea since two days, but it was self-resolving. A week before, he met with his friends and he had a cannabis cookie. That was the first time he was eating uh, that kind of cookie, first time of recreational uh, substance to use. On nosopharyngeal swabs, uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection was confirmed. He was normal um, peripheral blood oxygen saturation. So according to national standards, he was uh, isolated at home and uh, invited to have a follow-up visits if anything happens or on a predefined checkup day. So it was really good for two weeks. And on day 14, uh, he's consulted in emergency department again. There is no respiratory tract symptoms, uh, but he is having abdominal pain since three days with nausea. His blood saturation, peripheral uh, blood saturation is fine. Uh, and on physical examination, there is no uh, changes. However, in uh, lab tests, he has... Uh, very increased serum lipase, MLAs, slightly CRP, and um, uh, word, uh, white blood uh, cell count. Um, he was actually diagnosed basing on this uh, with acute pancreatitis and hospitalized. Uh, at the time when he was hospitalized, we are always uh, conf uh, not confirm but repeat as uh, swabs. Uh, at least at that time of epidemic we were doing so, he was already 14 days uh, from first consultation, consultation and three weeks from first symptoms, he was uh, negative at PCR. His uh, chest x-ray was normal and abdominal ultrasound following and also CAT scan that you can see below following the lab tests and clinical symptoms, as I said, allowed us to diagnose uh, an acute pancreatitis. Um, so after four weeks, we, he was treated in a hospital, mainly symptomatically and mainly due to acute pancreatitis because for, in terms of COVID, there was no symptoms. Uh, and I saw him four weeks later in HIV outpatient clinic. 
So he was still having abdominal discomfort uh, well, when he was trying to expand a diet, and it was quite restrict diet. His serum lipase seems to be uh, much lower, but still increased. CRP still um, increased the norm in our hospital is five. Uh, his CD, CD4 count, because that's very interesting when uh, area to discuss as well, his CD4 count was 987. So it was uh, definitely less than in the beginning. Uh, let me remind, remind you 1,600, but it was still 55%. So there was no change in a distribution of, um, of different uh, subpopulation of, uh, of lymphocytes. Mm. And then um, he had, uh, his, in his blood, we could see already the IgG against um, uh, COVID. It was uh, the N protein anti-IgG. Uh, he had a controlled CAT scan and there was no changes in his lungs. So um, the, the CAT scan, just to re, uh, explain, uh, oftenly we saw that patients uh, in a course of the disease, um, the um, X-ray and CAT scan results were not following the clinical outcome. So the outcome, cl clinical outcome was positive and the patient was feeling better, but we could see that there is evolution in, uh, um, in radiological findings. But this case is interesting in my understanding. First of all, it is quite a typical presentation of COVID and we, didn't, we couldn't find any other symptoms. So the main question for us was, what was the most likely cause of pancreatitis? Was it uh, SARS-CoV-2 or was it this cannabis um, that he was having uh, three weeks uh, uh, before? Uh, the diagnosis of acute pancreatitis um, or both, or is it something else um, that we are not capturing like genetics, uh, not HIV related, or maybe something HIV related. And um, in literature, we have some uh, case uh, being described of uh, pancreatitis uh, in uh, presentation of COVID-19. Um, and it is it has been bind uh, to um, a family, so rather a genetic um, uh, present uh, a genetic related presentation. Um, another question might be which comorbidities play, played a role in a symptomatic uh, disease. And of course, we think about HIV, but he was absolutely suppressed. His immune status was, um, I'm sure, better than mine at that time, and um, his asthma. Uh, he took steroids, but that's um, um, that's that has two. That's a coin with two faces, right? Because uh, we know that um, uh, steroids that are inhaled could actually block some uh, SARS-CoV-2 proteins, and have been uh, already uh, discussed and proposed uh, to use as um, um, early, early treatment in uh, COVID patients, uh, although not in standards, we could see that kind of development. So I would not say steroids are a negative factor here. And we know that asthmatic patients are not really um, having increased risk uh, of COVID-19 as compared to patients uh, without asthma. So again, uh, if some genetic uh, uh, factors playing a role here, we don't know. I found a really interesting um, insight from Chinese studies. So they were they were in respect to digestive symptoms because also to mention that you have definitely more ACE2 in, in the receptors in a GI tract than in your lungs. So it would be actually expected to have a lot of GI symptoms in the course of COVID-19, but we do see mostly respiratory symptoms. But the pathologic is here. So, so they compared patients with digestive symptoms and with respiratory symptoms. And first of all, they found what I think this case presents as well, that uh, these patients with digestive symptoms had a longer course between symptoms onset and viral clearance. Uh, we could say that they have I couldn't say that the viral clearance, clearance was longer, but definitely um, the, onset of, uh, the onset of disease itself was uh, uh, longer and the dynamic was really slow. Um, these patients with digestive symptoms are more likely to test positive for viral RNA in stool. So it's really 
interesting whether it could be uh, an, um, in terms of discussing infectivity. In infectivity. We now uh, looking into pandemic, observing epidemiology of pandemic, that this is rather not the case, but still interesting observation. Um, and what I was mentioning, patients with digestive symptoms took longer to report for medical care. And this is really important because we might miss patients with really severe diseases uh, that are not, not recognized as uh, in course of COVID. Um, and then uh, we know that intestinal wall, wall invaded by SARS-CoV-2 may increase permeability and diminish functional barrier. So I can imagine how many interesting questions that opens. Um, and whether we could uh, see uh, prolonging that uh, disease into some further um, uh, long COVID, for example, um, effects. Anyways, I also wanted to show you in respect to this case, um, the uh, overview that we perform in a group of almost 200 patients in Poland, those were patients with COVID-19 and HIV, not only hospitalized, most of these patients were not hospitalized, but only um, followed, up in, out, uh, followed out, uh, up in outpatient clinic. So uh, in general, we can see that um, the requirement for oxygen is very rare. 23% of these patients we had under follow-up were, were hospitalized, 15% received any COVID treatment, 13% oxygen therapy, ICU 1.8% and 3.5% died. So I think that this shows that um, we should not worry in terms of our HIV patients who are uh, well controlled with good immune status. Uh, they should not be in a, a higher risk, but they might be a, ca a case of a different unusual uh, clinical course. So that's another interesting case. A lot of questions that I have myself and I was not able to answer them, uh, but the literature might be growing and I also uh, encourage to share cases in this area. Um, so a late HIV late presenter, that happens uh, that some patients just because they um, have been in a hospital were lucky enough to get a test. And um, so we had some increase in late presenters um, diagnosis in, in, um, in times of COVID. And this is an example, a 70 year old Ukrainian woman uh, who is living in Poland since two years. She's newly diagnosed with HIV. Uh, here is that we knew that she is HIV before any COVID history. Uh, uh, definitely uh, a late, late presenter, CD4 count 11, 6% and viral load over half a million. In uh, her chest X-ray, a typical change is from TB and positive bacterioscopy and PCR test for tuberculosis. And then in the procedures that we had in our hospital as safety procedures, we were testing patients from non-COVID ward. There was only one ward uh, specially uh, uh, devoted to HIV AIDS patients. Uh, so these patients were routinely checked uh, and screened for COVID. And um, without any symptoms, uh, she has been diagnosed with COVID based on the screening, but there was no, uh, no need for oxygen therapy and thus no need for any COVID specific treatment. So we started, she was moved from HIV uh, ward to uh, COVID ward. And we started here uh, the four uh, uh, anti-TB treatment for drug anti-TB treatment. And according to guidelines, because she was so late present, uh, presenter, um, we waited as shortly as possible uh, uh, until we, we knew she was tolerating the drugs well. And within two weeks, we've started antiretroviral treatment, taking into account the uh, drug-drug interactions, twice daily dolutegravir and uh, TDFFTC. We also uh, started uh, antiretroviral treatment along with prednisolone, one milligram per kilogram, in order to decrease the risk of iris. Uh, after starting antiretroviral treatment, the patient worsened with fever onset each second day. 
so uh, we were really thinking whether it's a new oil, whether it's an um, unsuccessful uh, treatment or whether it's iris. Uh, everybody knows how difficult it's in the beginning. In theory, it's, it's really easy to suspect that, but to confirm that we can just wait and do nothing is very difficult. Uh, you can see here her CD4 count. So the, um, the, uh, this um, red arrow show, indicates when we started antiretrovirals. So we could see that it had an effect of immune reconstitutions, definitely had immune reconstitution. You can see here uh, the CRP. Uh, you could see that along with this immune reconstitution, uh, there was increased uh, immune uh, response, um, uh, inflammatory response. Here, um, it's a CD4, CD8 percentage. You can see it was increasing. Uh, so on the contrary, we could, we could say here, um, uh, I mean, we could say here we see the same uh, effect in terms of um, uh, immune uh, uh, reconstitution. Uh, and in different um, uh, CD4, uh, in different uh, lymphocyte uh, populations, and also afterwards a drop that, of course, relates to CD4 activity. And uh, finally, procalcitonin. Again, when we started antiretroviral treatment, we could see a uh, high peaking uh, uh, procalcitonin and um, a low uh, hemoglobin as um, marker of general condition. Um, however, mm, we stayed with what we were doing. Uh, uh, the patient continued with fever for each second day. Uh, all cultures that we were taking were negative. Uh, there was no evolution on CAT scan. There was need, no need to, for oxygen therapy. And um, finally, when we uh, we're able to obtain uh, the, the results for resistance testing uh, uh, from TB culture. It took a while. We could see that she has been uh, infected with uh, uh, isoniazid and atambutol streptomycin um, resistant uh, tuberculosis. Uh, and we have switched the treatment for TB. Uh, and the patient really slowly and gradually stopped having fevers. Uh, but we could, could still see uh, this effect for uh, prolonging for a while. So why I'm presenting this case uh, is because um, we were thinking, especially in the beginning of epidemic, whether COVID-19 could be a possible, I mean, SARS-CoV-2 could be a possible pathogen for iris, whether we should fear um, uh, what to do with the late presenters who are having COVID and uh, uh, starting antiretroviral treatment. Um, and then uh, um, is, it, is late presentation a pre predisposing factor for infection or for poor prognosis? This case clearly shows that rather not, in, I mean, otherwise not in this case. And I have a few other cases showing that it is rather not the case to see a poor prognosis of COVID in uh, HIV late presenters. Uh, maybe their poor prognosis are just so poor we can worsen that. Um, however, it's possible to overcome it and let's stay on a positive side of it. And just also to highlight some uh, data coming from, uh, from our, um, uh, our country, uh, you can see um, here that the main risk factor among patients with HIV were uh, the conventional COVID, so to say, risk factors. Uh, we couldn't see, of course, it's a low group, but we couldn't see uh, that it is dominating uh, in terms of that, in terms of hospitalization, we could see that we are more likely to hospitalize patients who are uh, detectable viral load with low CD4 count and um, who have comorbidities and co-infections. And the last case I wanted to show very quickly because we're just right to, uh, to the end of this talk. It's a patient with uncontrolled diabetes, was on effective card, but we couldn't really help with his diabetes. He was on a high dose of insulin and metformin. And this patient actually developed a really difficult, really severe COVID case. Uh, and it was not only the severe respiratory symptoms he had, he was hospitalized, high flow nasal oxygen therapy. He received steroid, remdesivir, 
uh, he had pulmonary embolism and that um, in result, he was also having uh, this uh, long recovery with intolerance of any physical examination, which we know it's a, it's a typical case for uncontrolled diabetes to have a severe COVID. And um, the question here, interesting question is whether our patients are more prone to so-called long COVID uh, or not. Um, and just to highlight and finish, uh, this is also research we've done uh, in the region, in Europe, showing that um, there are important drug-drug interactions uh, in the HIV COVID patients. We need to consider them the most significant interaction that we could see the most frequent with is with a higher dose of steroids. So just to keep it uh, in mind. And with that, thank you very much. And I wanted to show you that there was a beautiful tree uh, in the area of our hospital entrance. And after a really big storm, uh, the tree was down, but I'm still here and we are all still here. So let's stay on a positive side. Thank you very much.